All right. Well, welcome to Bible class. Glad that you're with us for our final chapter of the book by Ben Gizelbach. You are a theologian thinking right about the Bible. We're going to end chapter nine today. I was looking over the chapters. I was studying and reading over it, and uh, it's actually not as long as I originally thought it was. And so we're just going to go ahead and read through it in this last lesson today. And we'll pick up with First Thessalonians, and I believe we'll study um, First Thessalonians on Sundays, and I think we'll also do Second Thessalonians on Wednesdays. That way, we're kind of covering two books at once. Uh, but that's the current plan that I have: is First Thessalonians on Sundays and Second Thessalonians on Wednesdays. But let's get into pursuing humility. That's the title, basically, of this chapter is learning to pursue humility in anything and everything. And Ben starts by saying, no general introduction to theology would be complete without at least a brief chapter about humility, which, by the way, is a sad observation because I've never seen an introduction to theology that included a chapter on humility. I suppose their authors would argue it goes without saying, and they're probably right. Good theology is about sitting at the feet of God. You are the student. God is the teacher. And the foundation of learning is humility. Is it possible for a man dripping with pride to also be teachable? Well, Jesus reminds us that truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If a student walks, and that was John 13, 16, by the way, if a student walks into a class thinking he or she is the teacher, no one is going to learn anything. The very reason someone enrolls in a class is to place himself or herself under the training and expertise of the teacher. This is a natural, obvious picture of humility. Ponder this question for a minute. Is it possible for there to be a humble man of reasonable intelligence who is also not teachable? Humility, we should note, is the very foundation of learning. When God called Samuel to his service, Samuel replied, Speak for your servant hears, 1 Samuel 3.10. As it relates to your study of God's word, are you prepared to truly listen to him? Sometimes God's will says things in his word that you may not want to hear. In the words of Ben's father, we must be humble enough to accept the truth and humble enough to accept the fact that the truth may not be what we think it should be. The opposite of humility is pride. Perhaps with the exception of so-called sins of arrogance, pride is the, basically at the root of all sin. It was pride that caused Eve to believe the serpent's words, you will not surely die, Genesis 3, 4, making her believe that she could be greater than God, verses 5 and 6. And similarly, it is pride that causes many today to think, I can continue in sin and God's grace will abound, Romans 6, 1. Pride is what causes us to cheapen our obedience to God's commands regarding salvation, worship, marriage, morality, and the church. Sin is the attempt to dethrone God by preparing a throne for ourselves. But God is God alone, and he will not share his exclusive place, Isaiah 42, 8, and verses 11 of verse, chapter 48. Let's talk about the chief virtue here. Ben writes, I am convinced that humility is the single most important attitude that Christians can possess. As the disciples asked Jesus which of them would be given the more powerful position in the kingdom, which they incorrectly assumed would be a physical kingdom, Jesus replied by telling them that the greatness of a Christian is measured by his or her humility, Matthew 20, 26 through 28. In fact, not only is greatness measured by humility, but also humility is a prerequisite to even entering the kingdom, Matthew 18, 2 through 4. The Bible is replete with God demanding our humility. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble, James 4, 6, Proverbs 3, 34. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you, James 4, 10. Salvation begins with the very recognition that we are unworthy of God and only deserve judgment. In the words of Richard Baxter, humility is not a mere ornament of a Christian, but an essential part of the new creature. It is a contradiction in terms to be a Christian and not be humble. All who will be Christians must be Christ's disciples and come to him to learn. And the lesson which he teaches them is to be meek and lowly. And so let's make this practical now, this last section that we're studying here. Let's make this practical. Perhaps every honest Christian would say they have room to become more humble. What are some ways we can achieve this? Number one, think about the cross every day. The late John Owen eloquently said, Labor therefore to fill your hearts with the cross of Christ. Consider the sorrows he underwent, the curse he bore, the blood he shed, the cries he put forth. 
the love that was in all this to your souls and the mystery of God, of the grace of God therein. Meditate on the vileness, the demerit, and punishment of sin as represented in the cross. The blood, the death of Christ is Christ crucified for sin, and shall not our hearts be crucified with him unto sin? Shall we give entertainment unto that, or hearken unto its dalliances, which wounded, which pierced, which slew our dear Lord? God forbid. Fill your affections with the cross of Christ, that there may be no room for sin. No one looks good as they stand next to the cross. That harsh, blood-stained wooden beam is never complimentary to us. Far from offering us flattery, writes John Scott, the cross undermines our self-righteousness, and we can stand before it only with a bowed head and a broken spirit. Remember the words of the song, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. It is hard to be arrogant while worshiping our Lord after he has washed us in a most gruesome way in his own blood and baptism, Romans 6, 4. It is hard to commandeer the church of Christ for our own gain, knowing the price he paid for her, Acts 20, 28. It is hard to be a bad spouse, knowing how much Christ has selflessly invested in us, Ephesians 5, 25. It is hard to return to a life of sin, knowing that in doing so, we are thrusting yet another crudely fashioned nail through the precious body of Jesus, Hebrews 6, 6. So think about the cross every day. Number two, begin every day acknowledging your ultimate dependence upon God. Everything, including each breath, is given to you by the grace of God, Acts 17, 25. Apart from his son, ultimately, we can do nothing, John 15, 5, verse 5. You need him in everything. Number three, begin every day by expressing your gratefulness to God. Ungratefulness is a fundamental quality of people who are always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth, 2 Timothy 3, 2, and 7. C.J. Mahaney notes, an ungrateful person is a proud person. If I'm ungrateful, I'm arrogant. And if I'm arrogant, I need to remember God doesn't sympathize with me in that arrogance. He is opposed to the proud. On the other hand, you create a hostile environment of pride to be able to grow when your heart is truly thankful. Basically saying, if you're truly thankful, pride's going to have a hard time growing. Every day I want to recognize that everything I have is a result of God's grace, of which I am utterly unworthy. Number four. Throughout the day, regularly practice spiritual disciplines such as prayer, Bible study, and worship. In other words, live intentionally for him, Romans 12, 1. Pray regularly and often, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. When you're driving to work, sitting in the car by yourself, meditate and memorize scripture. The, the psalmist says, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways, Psalm 119, verse 15. Number five. Let God worry about your concerns. Peter tells us that humility in part comes by casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you, 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. If we are honest, at the root of anxiety is often the delusion of self-sufficiency, which is just another word for pride. In other words, anxiety is often a result of dependence upon oneself rather than upon God. Instead, humble yourself by acknowledging your constant need for God and by recognizing that God is the only one true the only one truly in control, Romans 8, 28. Conclusion. Pride ultimately manifests itself as independence from God, whereas humility ultimately manifests itself as dependence upon God. Uh, such an acknowledgement is hard to admit, but it is at the very heart of being a child of God. We cannot help but examine ourselves when we hear Jesus' parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed this way, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get, but the tax collector standing far off wouldn't even lift his eyes up to heaven, but beat upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the ones who humble himself will be exalted. Luke 18, 9 through 14. There are only two possible responses to God's word, merit or mercy. To trust in our own merit is to walk up to God and say, move over, I'd like to sit down. To trust in God's mercy is to say, God, 
I am unworthy of you and your law. Help me be the best servant that I can be. Being a good Bible student is all about humility. It does not matter how educated or skilled you are. Good theology is not reserved merely for intellectual elites, but it is primarily for regular people like you and me. Moms, dads, mechanics, plumbers, secretaries, nurses, waitresses, school teachers, farmers, desk jobs, etc. True Christianity is for those who are genuinely humble as they kneel before God. I want to thank you for studying with us, and I've enjoyed reading this book, and I hope it's been beneficial to you as well. Lord willing, on Sunday, we will pick up with 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, and until then, take care. Thanks for studying with us, and God bless.